PBR Automotive Proprietary Limited would like to welcome you to this video on brake drag diagnosis. A copy of the flowchart used in this video is included in the package and provides a quick ready reference to the procedures carried out to diagnose this not uncommon problem. Brake drag occurs when the lining material of either a drum brake or disc brake is held in contact with its friction surface without the brake pedal being applied. When brake drag is encountered, customer concerns usually center around the lack of vehicle performance and an increase in fuel consumption. Sometimes this may be indicated by an abnormally high brake pedal or in extreme cases, a loss of brake effectiveness accompanied with a pungent burning odor. Brake drag can occur on individual wheels, wheels on a common axle, diagonal pairs of wheels, or all wheels of a vehicle, and can be caused by either hydraulic or mechanical means. As with all braking problems, a logical and systematic approach to diagnosis greatly reduces diagnostic time. The previously mentioned flowchart, shown here, sets out the procedure we will be following throughout this video. The first step in the diagnostic process is to drive the vehicle, applying the brakes at regular intervals to bring them to operating temperature. There are two important points to be observed when carrying out this process. The first is that we are not trying to fade the brakes. This only damages the lining material and is not necessary for our purposes. The second is that we need to maintain this temperature for a period of approximately five minutes to ensure that the heat is transferred to the brake fluid as well as the brake assemblies themselves. On completion of this temperature normalizing process, the vehicle should be returned to the workshop and the wheels raised clear of the ground. All wheels should now be spun by hand to check for abnormal drag. Once the wheel or wheels with abnormal drag have been identified, we now have to determine if the problem is a hydraulic or mechanical one. The flowchart tells us to release the bleed nipple on the affected wheel or wheels. This allows us to determine whether hydraulic pressure is being retained in the system causing the drag. In a normal system with unblocked bleed nipples, the fluid should only move slowly up the tube under the force of gravity. If the system is retaining pressure, a solid spurt of fluid will be seen moving rapidly up the bleeder tube until the pressure has been relieved. Depending on the results of this test, the flow chart will now tell us to follow one of two paths. Initially, we will follow the path indicating pressure retention. The first test is to remove the master cylinder cap and check to see if the system will gravity bleed. The cap is removed to ensure that if a diaphragm is fitted, it has not become inflexible or extended down too far due to low fluid level. If this was the case, atmospheric pressure would not be applied to the fluid, preventing it from flowing out of the bleed nipple. If fluid does not flow from the nipple, the next step on our chart tells us to disconnect the flexible hose from the steel pipe and again check for fluid flowing from the system. This time, from the end of the steel pipe. Fluid dripping from the pipe indicates a problem exists with the flexible hose and it will need replacing. Flexible hoses can deteriorate or become damaged to the point where they become partially blocked. Often a part of the inner lining can detach, acting like a flap valve and allowing fluid to flow one way unimpeded but restricting flow from the opposite direction. They may also become twisted due to improper assembly, creating a similar effect. If fluid does not drip from the steel pipe, the flow chart will direct us to undo the fitting from the master cylinder for the circuit it is connected to. Fluid dripping from the master cylinder port would indicate that the problem lies in one of the steel lines running to the flexible hose. If this is the case, the pipe should be inspected for external denting or crushing and any damaged ones replaced. If fluid does not drip from the port, the master cylinder mounting nut should be loosened and the cylinder pulled forward approximately 10 millimeters. This checks to see if either the pedal push rod 
booster output rod, or stoplight switch adjustment could be forcing the master cylinder pistons forward, blocking the compensating port or ports. The compensating port is designed to allow for changes in the brake fluid's volume due to heat buildup in the brakes. Should this port be covered over, the expanding fluid will not be able to enter the reservoir, causing pressure to build up in the system and the brakes to drag. If fluid now drips freely from the master cylinder port, the adjustment of the pedal push rod, booster output rod and stoplight switch will need to be checked and adjusted to manufacturer's specifications as necessary. Should fluid still not have dripped from the master cylinder port, the flowchart tells us to check for the presence of a residual line pressure valve. These valves sit in the outlet ports of some master cylinders and were only used with drum brakes. Their purpose was to retain a small amount of pressure in the circuit when the brakes were released. This ensured that the wheel cylinder pistons were kept in contact with the ends of the brake shoes. This eliminated the need for the pedal to be pumped to bring the pistons into contact with the shoes and help to maintain a high brake pedal. The presence of these valves can be easily checked by pushing a small piece of wire into the port. If a line pressure valve is present, spring resistance will be felt, followed by fluid dripping from the port. These valves are no longer used in the majority of modern systems. Wheel cylinders now being fitted with springs and cup expanders. In a disc brake system, any fluid pressure retained in the lines when the brakes are released will cause them to drag and should a line pressure valve be fitted, the incorrect master cylinder will need changing with a genuine replacement part designed for the vehicle. If no line pressure valve is present, the problem will lie in the master cylinder itself. The most probable cause being the compensating ports being covered by either sticking pistons or swollen rubbers caused by fluid contamination. Or in the center valve design, swelling of the rubber valves. If this is the case, the master cylinder will require overhauling or replacement. Now before we leave the pressure retention path, here's a hint to help speed the diagnostic process. If two or more wheels are dragging, the problem will most likely lie in the master cylinder area, making it safe to proceed straight to the step on the flowchart that asks you to loosen off the master cylinder retaining nuts. That completes the pressure retention path of the flowchart. We shall now follow the path that would be taken if the fluid discharge from the bleed nipple was normal, indicating no pressure was being retained in the system. Looking at the flowchart reveals that we are again faced with a choice of two paths. Since the majority of vehicles are now fitted with disc brakes to at least the front wheels, we shall follow the disc brake path first. The first instruction on our flowchart is to check the caliper slides on floating calipers for seizing. And this is best done by first removing the caliper and then moving the slides to the limit of their travel in both directions. Tight slides don't allow the caliper to release properly, causing the outside pad to drag, overheat or wear more. If this condition exists, then the slides from both calipers on the axle should be removed, cleaned and lubricated. Should the slides be free, the next step on our chart is the checking of the caliper piston for seizing. This can easily be accomplished by pushing the piston all the way back in its bore. An assistant is then used to gently pump the brake pedal about half distance. And the piston movement observed. The piston should move freely, with virtually no effort being required to push the brake pedal down. If a caliper is found to have a seized or partially seized piston, both it and the caliper from the other side should be overhauled at the same time. Our final check in the flow path is for rear disc brake calipers with integral handbrakes. The drum brake in that design of park brake is only a small drum brake and hence will be covered in the drum brake path of the flowchart. The first step with this design is to disconnect the handbrake cable and make sure the apply lever moves freely. 
A seized or tight apply lever indicates internal problems, necessitating a caliper overhaul of both sides. If the levers prove to be free, the next check is the cables themselves. Have an assistant move the lever in and out while pulling on the cables. They should slide easily and, if tight, will require lubrication or replacement. Finally, ensure that the cables are adjusted as per manufacturer's specifications and that the apply levers are back against their stops. If we now turn our attention to the brake drum path, we can see that due to the brake having more components, the list of possible faults is also correspondingly more. In any diagnostic procedure, it's always wise to check the simple things first. And so it is with our first check, handbrake adjustment or cable seizure. The solution may be as simple as backing off the adjustment or disconnecting the cable and check for seizing. Our next step, should the handbrake cables and adjustment be correct, is to check the brake shoe adjustment. Again, a simple readjustment of the brake may be all that is required. Should these last two checks reveal no problems, the brake drums will again need removing to allow a closer inspection of the brakes. The brake should be checked for broken or distorted shoe return springs or retaining clips. Wheel cylinders should also be checked for seizing by having an assistant slowly depress the brake pedal whilst watching the pistons for movement. Finally, the chart suggests the checking of the brake shoes for distortion. Whilst this is not a common problem, instances still occur, especially if the brakes have been subjected to abnormally hard use. If distortion is suspected, accurate checking will require removal of the shoes from the backing plate. That completes this video on brake drag. But before we finish, let's just review what we've learned so far. Brake drag occurs when the lining material of either a disc brake or drum brake is held in contact with its friction surface without the pedal being applied. Customer concerns will usually center around a lack of vehicle performance, an increase in fuel consumption, and in extreme cases, a lack of brake effectiveness accompanied with a pungent odor. Brake drag can occur on individual wheels, wheels on a common axle, diagonal pairs of wheels, or all wheels of a vehicle. Brake drag can be caused by either hydraulic or mechanical means. The first step in the diagnostic process was to drive the vehicle, applying the brakes at regular intervals to bring them to operating temperature. Once this had been done, the vehicle was then returned to the workshop and the wheels raised clear of the ground. The wheels were then spun by hand to identify the wheel or wheels that were dragging. A bleed nipple was then released on the affected wheel or wheels to check for pressure buildup in the system. Should abnormally high pressure be present, the flow chart would have directed us to the hydraulic pressure retention path. On this path, the first step was to remove the master cylinder cap and then check if the brake would gravity bleed. If fluid did not flow from the nipple, the flexible hose was disconnected from the steel brake pipe. Fluid dripping from the steel pipe indicated a restriction in the flexible hose. However, should fluid not have dripped from the steel pipe, the next instruction was to disconnect it from the master cylinder. If fluid then dripped from the master cylinder port, the problem was said to lie in one of the steel pipes leading to the flexible hose. Failing that, the master cylinder was loosened on the booster, moved forward approximately 10 millimeters, and the port again checked for fluid dripping from it. This was done to check the adjustment of the pedal push rod, booster output rod, or stoplight switch adjustment. If any of these were out of adjustment, one or both pistons in the master cylinder would have to be pushed forward, blocking the compensating ports and causing pressure to build up in the system. If still no fluid dripped from the master cylinder port, the presence of the residual line pressure valve was then checked for. 
These valves, being only used with early drum brake systems, will cause a disc brake to drag appreciably, and if encountered, will most likely be due to an incorrect master cylinder being fitted. If no residual line pressure valve was found, yet fluid is still not flowing from the master cylinder port, then swollen rubbers covering the compensating ports, probably due to contaminated fluid, is the most likely cause. In either case, the master cylinder will have to be removed for repair or replacement. In finishing off the pressure retention path, we stated that if two or more wheels were found to be dragging, it was safe to assume that the problem lay in the master cylinder area. Making it safe to proceed to the point in the flowchart where the master cylinder is loosened on the booster. Having then completed the pressure retention path, we turned our attention to the wheel brakes themselves, starting with the disc brake path. Here we first checked the caliper slides for seizing, followed by a check of the caliper piston for similar problems. In rear disc brake calipers fitted with integral part brakes, the actuating levers were checked for free movement, followed by an examination of the cables and a final adjustment. With drum brakes, it was noted that the larger number of parts meant that more checks were required. First on the list was a check of the handbrake cable adjustment, followed by an inspection of the cables themselves. The main brake adjustment was then checked, and if proved to be correct, the drum removed for a closer inspection of the brake. Shoe return springs and retaining clips were then examined for brakes or distortion whilst wheel cylinders were checked for seizing. Our final check was to remove the brake shoes and check them for distortion as well. PBR Automotive Proprietary Limited hopes that this video has been of assistance in the diagnosis of brake drag. For different braking problems, we draw your attention to the other videos in this series.